the next speaker is Carlos Martins and he's gonna talk about variation of fundamental constants. So please start your sharing, please. Carlos. So okay. It should, should now be full screen, right? Yeah, yeah, it works. Please go ahead. Okay, Thanks. excellent. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, to present this work. So Anupam was, was trying to bridge the gap between uh, theory and experiment. I'll try to bridge the gap between theory and astrophysical observations. Um, and essentially, I want to talk uh, about tests of the stability of nature's fundamental constants. Uh, and the, uh, the motivation is essentially coming uh, from the acceleration of the universe. So, so we've seen that the universe is accelerating uh, and we're trying to understand what is this uh, mysterious dark energy, in particular whether or not it's a cosmological constant, i.e. vacuum energy. Because if it is a vacuum energy, its value is much, much lower than what uh, quantum field theory would predict. If it's not a cosmological constant, if it's some dynamical scalar field, then almost certainly you're violating the Einstein equivalence principle at some level. So one way or the other, it seems to be the case that there's new physics out there waiting to be discovered. So one, one of the tasks of, of um, forthcoming astrophysical facilities, uh, just like local experiments, is to search for, to identify, and ultimately to try and characterize this, this new physics. Um, so for, for, for the purposes of, of the, this 30 minutes, I, I want to focus on, on scalar fields, just because we know that they're out there. We, we know that thanks to, to the LHC. They're part of, of nature's building blocks. Um, and we also know that if you put these fields in your Lagrangian, they'll typically couple to everything else, to all the other degrees of freedom, unless you have some, some symmetry, some mechanism to suppress this coupling. So broadly speaking, you should expect uh, these couplings to roll in time and, and to rumble in space, so to be environmental, environmentally dependent, just like they, they run with, with energy. And, and experimentally, that, that, that last part is, of course, very well known. So thinking of astrophysical and, and, and cosmological settings, you might expect that these varying couplings uh, would lead to observable lo long-range forces and, and various other astrophysical signatures. Uh, I don't have time to discuss all of these, uh, but just to point uh, to a couple of them, uh, if uh, you have a varying French structure constant, for example, you will violate the usual temperature redshift relation and will also violate uh, the distance duality relation. So, so there's various uh, things that come together if you break some of these assumptions. Now, of course, there are things like indirect bounds. So, so if you if these couplings do vary, you could think of very strong changes to, to, to the value of vacuum energy, uh, and, and these would, would be tightly constrained. Uh, but given that we don't really seem to understand uh, the value of cosmological constant and so on, um, th these bounds, apart from being indirect, should be taken with a, with a substantial amount of, of salt. Um, so the pragmatic approach um, it would be that this is an observational issue. If one knows how to measure these things uh, observationally, if one knows how to test the stability of these couplings, uh, what one should do it. Uh, if nothing else, simply because any measurement, and when I mean, when I, I use the word measurement, I mean it in the general sense, whether it's just a null result, an upper bound, or a detection of something new, will constrain fundamental physics and cosmology. And I'll present one or two specific examples of, of this statement in, in the next few minutes. Um, so the tool I'll, I'll be focusing on is a high resolution astrophysical spectroscopy. I just want to make a short historical point to remind you that precision spectroscopy has been at the origin of quantum mechanics. So we all know the story of uh, the issues of discrete spectral lines and photoelectric effect and so on. Uh, it has been uh, essential for the confirmation of quantum electrodynamics through, through the lamp shift. And in the last 20 years or so, several different Nobel Prizes have been awarded uh, for, very, for advances in high precision laser physics, which is uh, in one way or the other, also precision spectroscopy. So what has changed in the last uh, 
five, 10 years, let's say, is that there's a new generation of high resolution, ultra stable fiber fed astrophysical spectrographs that can carry out exquisite precision tests of um, a number of these things. Um, and the field is actually very vast these days. I don't have time to cover everything. I, I can just uh, make a little bit of self-advertisement and, and uh, point you to a, a review I wrote uh, about three years ago. It's actually a little bit out of date in, in a few aspects because, because uh, things have evolved in these three years, uh, but, it's, but it's nevertheless a good starting point if, if, you, if you want to know a bit more about the issue and in, and in particular about the, uh, the observational status. Um, I can try and summarize the observational status uh, in one slide and it looks like this. So there's various things you can measure astrophysically. The one that is easier to measure is the value of the fine structure constant at high redshift. Uh, so in the, in the two top panels, you have two different data sets. So what is plotted is the relative variation of alpha. So delta alpha over alpha, the, the laboratory value being the baseline. And you see various measurements as a function of redshift. Um, and you also, but you also should notice that the vertical axis has different scales in, in the two top plots. So in one case, it's hundreds of parts per million. So units of 10 to minus six. On the right, it's tens of parts per million. Now, the difference is that the data set on, on the left is archival data. It's basically the data of John Webb and his collaborators. So it's data that was not taken for the purpose of these measurements but which they fetched from archives and reanalyzed. Uh, that is a little bit um, problematic possibly because the way you calibrate the data for, for measuring alpha is very specific. And if you don't take the data for this specific purpose, you may not have the tools to do this calibration properly a posteriori. So on the right, you have a smaller data set where the data was taken specifically for this purpose. And that, that's one of the reasons why you see the, uh, the error bars are significantly smaller. So in any case, there is a lot of scatter. As you, as you can see, the, the data is clearly very messy. The spectrographs that we have today are not optimized for this kind of measurement. At the bottom, you have two other things that can be measured. Uh, so on the left, you have measurements of the proton to electron mass ratio, again, this can be measured up, up to redshift four. And these are direct measurements, like in the case of alpha. And then on the right, you have measurements of things that are various combinations, so various products of alpha, mu, and sometimes the proton gyromagnetic ratio. Um, okay, so, so as you see, there's a lot of scatter. The data is a bit of a mess. Uh, from this, you can do some, some analysis. So for example, you expect that if one of these couplings is varying, all the others should be varying, right? It's very difficult to have a, a model where only alpha varies and everything else is standard. Uh, so you can try and do a joint likelihood analysis. Uh, so this is model independent, it's just comparing data with data and see if there's any strong statistical preference for, for a variation. Um, and the answer is not really. So there is a preference for variations at one to two sigma level. So clearly not very strong. Um, I note that this is the case even if you exclude the web data. So even if you exclude the archival data, uh, the preference is still at one to two sigma. So actually the archival data and the non-archival data have the same statistical rate right now. Uh, but in any case, the main limiting factor at the moment is that the spectrographs that, that are being used have systematics at the level of three parts per million, at least in the case of alpha. So clearly we are, so we know how to do these measurements. There's lots of astrophysical sources where they can be made, but we are at the moment still systematics limited. And that, that's one reason to try and get new instruments to do this, the measurements. And I'll come back to that point in a second. Uh, before that, let me just comment quickly that there's also a, a claim, so, so some evidence for a spatial variation. So if you take the, the alpha data at face value uh, and try and fit a dipole to it, uh, there is some evidence that uh, uh, the statistical level, so ignoring systematics, there is some evidence which initially when John Webb and collaborators proposed this was at level of four sigma. Now, so with, with, the, with the newest data, it's, the evidence is lower, maybe two to three sigma, depending on how, how you do the analysis. 
Uh, but I also note that you can also try and do the analysis with the measurements of mu, the proton to electron mass ratio, so fit a dipole to it. And if there was a common mechanism behind the, the, the hypothetical dipole, you would expect the two dipoles to, al to align on the sky, to be in the same direction. And this is not what you find if, if, you, if you fit for, for the alpha and, and mu data separately. Um, so, that, so that various efforts have been made to improve this data set, to do better measurements, tighter measurements, but also to do the measurements at higher redshifts. So the argument being, if we have a scalar field varying very slowly, it's going to be easier to find variations with big redshift lever arms. Uh, of course, there's also astrophysical constraints. At higher redshift, your sources will be fainter and all of that, so there's practical constraints. But there's certainly a motivation theoretically for doing these measurements at high redshift. And, and, and one of the things we've been doing recently is to get the first measurements of alpha uh, in the infrared, so using infrared spectrographs. So all the other measurements, so the ones you've seen in, in the previous slide at redshift four, uh, are obtained with, with optical telescopes and spectrographs. Uh, we've measured, we managed recently to do four measurements along the same line of sight. Uh, between redshifts 5.5 and 7. So these are the, the four highest direct redshift measurements of alpha. The uncertainty is quite big. It's, it's about 72 parts per million if you combine all four. Uh, but, but this is a proof of concept, right? It shows that this can be done in principle. And actually, the good news is that considering what, what we know about distribution of high redshift quasars and so on, there's probably something like 20 or 30 other quasars out there, high redshift quasars, where these measurements can also be done in principle. So this is, a, I think this is good news for the future. Um, now, you, you might ask yourself, since nothing has been seen clearly at parts per million, is it worth pushing down even further? And I, I would strongly argue that the answer is yes. And actually, the way to think about it is that if you have a dynamical scalar field, giving, for example, dark energy, you'd expect its equation of state or um, one plus its equation of state, which is essentially the ratio of kinetic to total energy, to be of order one. We know in the case of dark energy that this is constrained to be, let's say, less than 10 to the minus one. It's the same for varying alpha, except that the constraints are stronger. Um, so if this is not of order one, in principle, you have no natural scale in your theory to fix your variation. Either there's some fine tuning somewhere, or there's some symmetry that that suppresses this and forces it to be zero. So the argument then is that parts per million constraints are not necessarily uh, very strong. And an example, which, which many of you will know better than me, is the strong CT problem in QCD. So there's a parameter that you would expect to be of order one, but it's known to be less than 10 to minus 10 or something like that. So we may learn something new just by pushing that down this these bounds. Okay, so, so, so one improvement that, that, that is coming up is the espresso spectrograph. Uh, so, so this is bit, has been built by a consortium involving Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, and Switzerland, plus ESO. Uh, it's already at, at the VLT telescope in, in Paranal, so it, this is what it looks like. It's not very exciting because the spectrograph is actually inside the vacuum vessel, uh, but it's far more stable higher resolution and so on than other spectrographs. I can discuss the technical details later on. It also has the advantage that it can incoherently combine light from the four UT telescopes, so from the four VLTs. And essentially, this means getting light from an effective 16 meter diameter telescope. Uh, so the observations are currently stopped because of the pandemic. So ESO shut down the observatories in March. Uh, but our work plan, which, which we are uh, working on is more or less summarized here. We'll, we'll do some direct measurements of alpha uh, with significantly better precision and also not being limited by systematics. We'll also do some measurements of proton to electron mass ratio, the CMB temperature at non-zero redshift. Uh, we'll also try and do some measurements of the deuterium abundance, which is important, important for uh, big bang nucleosynthesis constraints. And we might also try to do a few other things having to do with lens quasars, uh, maybe do some precursor measurements of the redshift drift, uh, for those of you who know what that is, and so on. Um, okay, so, so in, in, the, 
in the final minutes, let, let me come back to this connection between varying couplings and dark energy. Um, so I already made the point that maybe, maybe this dark energy is a, is a cosmological constant, maybe it's a dynamical scalar field. Um, and, you, and you can use um, measurements of alpha, constraints on alpha to constrain dark energy as well. At, at least if you assume that it's the same underlying mechanism, the same scalar field or, or other mechanism that, that, is re, that is responsible for both. So in fact, you can think of two separate classes and I'm, uh, I'm gonna be creative and call them class one and class two. So class one is the case where the same degree of freedom gives you dark energy and alpha. In that case, the alpha evolution is parametrically determined. If you know the dark energy equation of state, you can predict what the evolution of alpha should be. Uh, but this also means that you can use alpha measurements to constrain dark energy, as I said, in addition to the usual supernova and CMB data and all the rest of it. So one example would be quintessence models. And on the top of the slide, we have an example of one such constraint. So on the vertical axis, you have the dark energy equation of state today, W0. On the horizontal axis, you have the coupling of the scalar field to electromagnetism in parts per million. And essentially, data tells you, you cannot have a, you cannot strongly you cannot have a big coupling and you cannot strongly deviate from a cosmological constant. So you have the one, two, and three sigma constraints, and the color map is the reduced chi square for the uh, for the field. Conversely, you could have a class two where dark energy is a cosmological constant, or some other, or given by some other mechanism. But you have a, a scalar field or some other degree of freedom that gives you the variation of alpha without affecting the cosmological dynamics. If that's the case and you assume that the, or, the, the origin of the two things is the same, obviously you'll make a mistake, but there are consistency checks that you can use in the analysis. Um, so in that case, you, alpha per se, so alpha measurements per se will not constrain cosmology, but will constrain particle physics parameters of the model. And, and one example is at the bottom. Uh, so these are constraints on two coupling parameters in a model uh, developed by Olive and Poskalov. So an, an example of this class is a, a more general example are what people call Bekenstein type models. And one can argue what, whether class one models or class two models would be the more natural ones. and. Uh, I'd certainly be interested in hearing the opinion of, of particle physicists in, in the audience. Um, so let, let me briefly mention one specific model to illustrate how, 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 how constraining some of these things can be. Uh, so, so this is the, uh, the rolling tachyon model proposed by Sen many years ago. Um, so this has a Bornenfeld type scalar. Um, and it's actually very nice in, 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 in this context because it's a very well-determined model. So it, at least if you're looking at low redshift constraints or so low redshift data, there's essentially one single parameter, which is the slope of the potential, which determines both the dark energy equation of state and the variation of alpha. Um, and due to, to these strong constraints on, on alpha at parts per million level, you end up with an extremely tight constraint on the dark energy equation of state, which is the, the one you see on the slide. So it's constrained to be, well, so one plus W zero is constrained to be less than a few times 10 to minus seven at, at, at three sigma. So what this means is that you'd never distinguish this model from lambda CDM using usual cosmological data, you know, supernova, CMB, et cetera. They're too close to, to minus one. But in this model, parts per million or you know, one part per million, 0.5 parts per million variation of, of alpha would are still allowed. I mean, in principle, you could detect them this way. And actually in this model, uh, you, if there is any variation of alpha, it has to be negative. So alpha, uh, delta alpha over alpha must, must be negative. It, can, it cannot be positive. So this is an example of how you know, predictive these models can be. Um, finally, I also want to emphasize that these models give you very tight constraints on the weak equivalence principle. So in these models, again, if you, you have a scalar field toy model, the scalar field in inevitably couples to nucleons because uh, nucleon masses have an electromagnetic contribution. So this will lead to violations of weak equivalence principle, which you can calculate, and therefore you can use alpha measurements 
and, and translate them into constraints on the equivalence principle. So essentially, you end up with a constraint on the Utvush parameter. Uh, and the recent analysis I did with a student uh, leads to, to the bound you see on, on it at the Utvush parameter, 4 times 10 to minus 15. So this includes the microscope bound and alpha measurements. So essentially, the addition of alpha data improves the microscope bound by a factor of three, and it's about 30 times stronger than local bounds from uh, lunar laser ranging and torsion balance and so on. I should add, though, that there is a model dependence in these constraints, uh, but the model dependence is, is, is relatively mild, is up to a factor of two, at least in all the uh, possible models that, that I could think of and explore. And Espresso and, and later on the, uh, the extremely large telescope will improve these bounds. So with, yes, with Espresso, we, we should reach sensitivity on the Utfush parameter at the level of two, maybe three times 10 to minus 16. And with next generation telescope with DLT, uh, maybe we can reach a se sensitivity of 10 to minus 18 or so, which is comparable to the uh, proposed step uh, satellite. So the point is that this, so these astrophysical measurements are competitive today and should be competitive in, in coming years. So just very briefly, I want to, measure, to mention something I've been working on recently, um, which is the lithium problem in, in big bag nucleosynthesis. So, so you, you all know the problem, I think, that there was actually some talks in this series about, about it a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, so th th there's a sort of five sigma detection of ignorance in, when it comes to the lithium abundance, when you compare uh, the theoretical expectation in what you measure. Um, and it has been known actually for, for a while that varying alpha can in principle provide a solution. So the, the reason being, the argument being that if you change alpha, heavier nuclei will be more affected. So in principle, you could think of a situation where you change the lithium abundance significantly in the right direction without changing the lighter nuclei too much. Uh, now, the problem is that if you change the lithium abundance, you also unavoidably change the deuterium abundance. And typically, that's the bottleneck because deuterium is very tightly constrained. So what we now, one problem in these analyses is that typically you assume that only alpha varies and all the other couplings are fixed. Um, but you can actually go beyond that. And so, so we developed a, a perturbative um, formalism um, for, for grand unified models where you, you allow all the couplings to vary, you know, energy levels, uh, particle masses, neutron lifetime, and so on. Um, and in, in a class of grand unified theories, you can express all these variations in terms of just three parameters. So the alpha value itself and two other dimensionless parameters, one coming from electric physics and the other one coming from QCD. And then you can explore you know, the, the entire parameter space, phenomenologically, of course. So in principle, any gut model will be characterized by these two additional parameters. Um, and I, 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 won't, I won't describe the, the analysis in detail. You can ask me afterwards. But essentially, the, the, uh, the outcome is that there are gut type models where alpha varies, where with a variation of alpha at the level of a few parts per million, you can solve the lithium problem, at least to the extent of making all the abundance is consistent with observations to within two or three sigma. Uh, you, you, you do affect the deuterium abundance as, as you expect and as it should, uh, but you don't affect it too much. And in principle, you can make things compatible to, to this level. But we're, at, we're working on this a little bit in more detail, but um, I think an astrophysical solution to the lithium problem is still the more likely one, but. Uh, particle physics or a fundamental physics explanation is still a, a viable possibility and it should maybe be explored. So, so just to conclude, I think I'm out of time. Um, so the acceleration of the universe shows that uh, there's something incomplete in our canonical theories of cosmology of particle physics. Uh, so there's new physics out there that one should look for. And what I've tried to to illustrate for you is that precision astrophysical spectroscopy is playing a role in this search and, and will be playing a role in, in the coming years. So at the moment, so, so the take home message is that if, if, if you focus on alpha, which is the, uh, the thing that's easier to measure and, and that has been more explored in more detail, 
there's nothing varying at the few parts per million level. Uh, and this, but this is already a very tight bound. It's stronger than some solar system tests like the Cassini bound. Uh, and it provides the best available weak equivalence principle constraints, even though there is some model dependence on, on these. Um, but there's, there's new tests coming. So Espresso is here. Uh, new results, new measurements will, will, will appear in, in the coming months and, and years. So let's see how, how quickly COVID goes away and, and we can resume our observations. And uh, looking into the next decade, the extremely large telescope uh, will we'll, we'll provide exquisite new tests uh, of um, equivalence principle violations, very, very, various other tests that cannot be done uh, with current instruments and in current telescopes. So uh, I like to think of this as a sort of guaranteed science in the sense that whether you find detections or no results, you're going to rule out some, some models that, that currently are viable. And there's also some synergies between these tests and other probes like Euclid and, and the SKA that uh, we can discuss later if people are interested. Uh, and, and with that, I, I stop. So thanks for, for listening and I'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions and discuss uh, anything that wasn't clear. Thank you, Carlos. So are there questions? If so, please speak up or raise your hand or write them in the chat. At the moment, I don't see any. So I wanted to ask a question from the particle physics side. Something so that I always have when I see this thing. So I mean, there is a regime of quantum field theory where we know the quantum field theory applies, say from the electron mass to the proton mass. We can actually be, I mean, could be much larger than this, but at least in this regime. Now, if I calculate the quantum contribution the, the change in the quantum contribution to the cosmological constant that comes from the variation of a fundamental constant in time, in space, anywhere, I find that this would correspond to a change in the cosmological constant, which is ruled out by, you know, 10 orders of magnitude, if not more, just because, you know, we, the, the, the scale of the cosmological constant is milli electron volt. Whereas all other particle physics scale are say GV, even if you put some loop suppression, even if you put, you know, alpha, even if you put this, you will never gonna get to milli electron volt. How can you reconcile these two things? Because we can do the calculation in that regime. This we are sure about it. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's true. I mean, it's a fair point, but, but it, again, I mean, my, my comparison point is the, uh, or would be the, cal the calculation of the cosmological constant, right? So, so we, we, we just might be missing some physics somewhere. And so, so, but so. my point is that we, for sure, we are missing some physics somewhere, but we're almost sure we're not missing any physics between the electron mass and the proton mass, or at least the rules of quantum field theory do apply in this regime. Then we might have other contributions to the cosmological constant, and this is clearly a right, huge yeah. problem, but there is at least this contribution. That's what I'm saying. And you have anything on that? Well, I mean, I, the, the, the only thing I, I, I can say is that uh, this is something that, that, so these values are something that can be measured and, and, and therefore, you know, we, we measure them. And, and if we just get upper bounds, uh, that's great. And we, we confirm that those calculations to, to the level of sensitivity that, that we have. And if something different is found, then, you know, maybe this is a clue of where some physics is missing. I mean, I'm, I'm not disputing those calculations, of course. I'm just saying, observationally, it's something that that that, uh, that, that should be checked. Okay. Thank. Uh, are there questions from the audience? I do not see any so i guess we can thank carlos again and we'll see you next time actually tomorrow for two more seminars thanks <laughs>